A Chip in the Mirror by Richard L. Sager. When I saw the ad, I had to respond. Not a day went by where I didn't think about my old car, even if only for an instant. Out of all the cars I owned over the years, I always regretted the sale of my 1967 Shelby Mustang. We all grow old and age makes us reminisce. So much of our lives are behind us and so little ahead. So much time, so much living. I last saw my car one rainy night when a buyer came over with cash in a briefcase. That was 30 years ago. Where my car went, I have no idea. I lost all the paperwork through the passage of time. All that remains are memories. I'm in my late 60s now, a long time widower, and I lust for the return of those memories. I want another Shelby Mustang. After I called to the seller, I got my lazy bones up from the couch and changed clothes to go see the car. I'd seen many in the past, but none felt right to me. None captured the memories I sought. I wanted the same color, the same stripes as my old faithful. I wanted another that triggered my senses, one that flooded me with youthful endorphins. This car was located two states over, so I had some driving ahead of me. I went to my garage to access my daily driver. When the door opened, I could not help but see the empty space next to my car. For decades, it remained vacant, yet the image of her persisted, a phantom outline in my mind's eye. I wasted no time getting on the road, and I drove, thinking about my past, my youth, and my middle age. A road trip is a good time to reflect, and the solitude of driving alone is conducive to such thought. It made me sad to think of the more painful points in my life, such as the death of my parents and the loss of my wife. It seems we remember our worst times more than our best. Maybe it's a survival mechanism, a thing engineered into our DNA. I don't know. Maybe reliving happier times with an old car might help wash away my darker memories. That was wishful thinking and I knew it. My memories, good and bad, would always be there. Maybe this car, if it was the right one, would push back the bad memories, impounding them in the storage lot of my past. Maybe. I arrived in town as the sun began to set, triggering a brilliant solar rage against the approaching twilight. I navigated along boulevards and side roads, eventually leading to a small, tidy street, a safe harbor that sequestered this metal monster from the purview of unwanted interlopers. The seller told me it had been years since the old beast saw daylight. So long, most who ever knew about the car had either died or moved away, taking the secret with them. Pulling up the long driveway, I could see that the house appeared well-groomed, yet it felt forlorn. Sadness exuded from the house a bad vibration telegraphing itself to my nerve endings. I could not explain why, but this was imagination, nothing more. I dismissed such feelings, realizing I was here to do business. If the car matched my requirements, I was prepared to make the next move. I rang the front doorbell and heard a faint clang of chimes from within. I heard steps, lethargic footfalls drawing closer to get the door. It opened with the vacuum seal of an Egyptian tomb. Yes, can I help you? asked a frail and diminutive man from behind the screen. He looked about 80, maybe 85. I'm here about the car, I said. He nodded and turned, presumably to retrieve the keys. I waited for what felt like an eon of time and then heard a voice from around the back. He called to me from the side door and I found myself walking with purpose along the driveway toward the back, accompanying him to the detached garage that held what I hoped to be the jewel I'd long awaited. He entered the garage and hit the button, raising the mechanical door. It slid upwards, revealing taillights, unmistakable Shelby taillights. Then I saw the back glass, that swooping aerodynamic piece so unique to the car. The paint, a brilliant shimmering paint with white stripes, looked a lot like mine. I became excited, gripped by an exhilaration unlike anything I'd felt in years. My memories began flowing. I began to remember the nighttime grudge runs, the fierce street racing, the ill-gotten cash, and my lovely wife who accompanied me through it all. The old man held up the keys, offering them to me. Start it up, he said. Though the car looked dusty, I could see that he'd maintained the old girl. The garage walls were decorated with jugs of antifreeze, bottles of motor oil, a battery maintainer, and various tools for general maintenance. I eased into the driver's seat. The interior lights were as I remembered. They came on faint, but bright enough to remind me that I was sitting in a thing that was more than metal and glass. The car had a presence, a thing indescribable to the uninitiated. I put the ignition key into the slot and gave a twist. 
She started right up and snarled through boisterous dual exhaust. I gave a couple of shots on the throttle and the mechanical linkage juiced the carburetor, throwing aggressive revs to pistons, connecting rods, and crankshaft. The engine made a clattering sound that reminded me instantly of my old ride. My mind lapsed into a hazy fog. I wanted this car. I didn't need to drive her. She was the one for me. I shut off the ignition and stepped out. How much, I asked, already knowing the answer. He shot me a number, far less than his asking price in the ad. I was surprised. I accepted without another thought. It's a beautiful thing when a motivated seller meets a motivated buyer. I went back to my car and opened the trunk, pulling out a sack of cash. I conducted the transaction in his living room, counting a ton of money. He watched with a dispassionate face, a haunting and gaunt look, yet in his eyes I could see relief. He signed off on the title and handed it to me with the keys. I never thought I'd be buying a car tonight and I had made no plans. Now I faced the logistics of getting the car home. I wanted to ask if he could drive my daily while I drove the Shelby but I really couldn't expect an old man to make a long journey. I had to manufacture another plan. I arranged to leave my car in his driveway and drive the Shelby home tonight. Then I would take a bus back and collect my daily driver, problem solved. The drive home proved invigorating. The bark of the engine and the sensation of speed hooked me, the Shelby cutting through the night like a Viking ax. I'd not felt this way in decades. The car ate huge quantities of pavement and drank gas with drunken abandon. I filled up several times on the way back. At gas stations, I received compliments and gave photo opportunities, all that slowed my return, but I relished the attention. When I reached home, it was morning. I'd driven all night and barely felt the effects. This car energized me. I pulled into my driveway and took a moment to look over the interior in the morning light. It looked old yet cared for. I cast my eyes upon the driver's side mirror. I saw a small chip apparent in the upper left corner a chip that I recalled from many years ago, a chip unique to my old faithful. A shockwave passed through me. Could it be after all these years? Was this my old car? I looked more intently at the chip and knew it to be identical. Can't be, I said. No, it really can't be. But it was. I got out and sprinted to my garage to prepare the vacant spot, her old space. I moved anything aside that might touch or graze the beautiful, resilient paint ensuring enough space around the perimeter that no harm could come. I opened the garage door and guided my girl to her original spot. I killed the engine and sat, enchanted by the telltale chip in the mirror. This was my car. I got out and closed the garage door, taking the title, sales slip, and keys with me. I made my plan to get back and pick up my daily driver. I caught a Greyhound bus to the nearest major city, taking me as close to the small town as possible to retrieve my car. From there, I hailed a taxi to the street that reunited me with my beloved Shelby. The cab driver asked twice if I was sure about the address. I telegraphed no doubts and with great impatience reaffirmed my directive to get me to that street. The cab turned into a neighborhood unfamiliar to me. The streets looked strange. When we arrived at the address, I saw my car in the driveway, but the front lawn, previously manicured like a putting green, was now overgrown with two feet of grass. That meticulously maintained house from the night before now presented windows that were boarded up and the front door was hanging off of its hinges. Everything looked grimy, the filth of a dwelling that had aged by decades, a disused thing ready for the wrecking ball. I feared to ask the cab driver what happened, but I did. He told me the area had been condemned several years back. The plan was to expand the nearby airport, but a recession stopped it cold. I said nothing of how or why my car ended up in a condemned neighborhood. All of the houses were now abandoned, overgrown like a post-apocalyptic nightmare. I paid my fare and the cab left in haste. I went up to the door and rang the bell. No sound came forth. The house had an eerie, abandoned feel about it, just like the whole damn neighborhood. I gave a hard knock and afforded the old man a minute to get up an answer, but he failed to come forth as he did before. I was overcome with an uncanny urge to get in my car and get the hell away from this place. And that is exactly what I did, leaving behind the wreckage of this neighborhood. Wreckage that one scant day ago did not exist. I used my drive time to spin a theory on what just happened. I'd read about parallel universes, and perhaps I had just stepped into one. Or was it a dream? But this was nonsense. I'm a rational man. More likely amounted to nothing more than a hallucination. 
but I wasn't prone to hallucinations and I didn't do drugs. None of this made any sense and none of my theories truly answered my questions with any degree of satisfaction. I drove on. When I arrived back home, I hit the door opener and waited. The garage cycled on command, revealing my Shelby parked off to the right. But what's this? I see the headlights are staring back at me. How did this happen? I scrolled through my memory. I am convinced I drove that 67 straight in, didn't I? I pulled my daily driver in and closed the garage. I stopped by my old faithful and paused. I felt something coming from it. A strange tingling went through my heart. I touched the paint. A cold feeling penetrated my soul and I withdrew my hand in haste. I stared at the headlights. They looked right back, empty and soulless. Was I losing my mind? I walked to the side door, but not without giving one more glance at the Shelby. I shut off the light and went into the house. I slept well and no dreams, good or bad, permeated any of my thoughts during the night. I woke up at my regular hour and had breakfast. Sunday morning sunlight came through my window, hinting at a morning run in the 67. I felt her beckon me. The temptation drew me toward the keys hanging from a peg next to the side door. I plucked the keys from the peg and opened my garage. There she was, my old faithful, parked as I remembered. I backed her out of the garage and closed the door. But wait, last night she had pointed the other way, looking out from the garage. Why was I backing out instead of driving forward? I must be losing my mind. I paused and gripped the wooden steering wheel, deliberating whether I should take this run. I depressed the clutch and returned the shifter to reverse, navigating down my driveway to the street. I slapped the shifter to first, hit the gas, and we were away. I drove along boulevards and city streets, wound through neighborhoods and industrial areas, with the true intent of making my way to the Pacific Coast Highway. I breached the PCH and found my comfort zone, banging through gears, gaining that perpetual momentum of man and machine, finding that sweet spot of driving nirvana. I hit the high double digits and the lows as the Pacific coast guided me through all of its dramatic turns, mirroring the majesty of the Pacific Ocean with undulating waves of asphalt. I heard a voice while I drove, a calming voice that soothed me, a voice that loved and wooed me. A beautiful and young woman sat in my passenger seat, a phantom apparition. I felt the car accelerate, the throttle moving away from the steadiness of my right foot, spiriting me away to higher integers of speed. The voice told me not to fear, not to worry, that speed was the most noble state of existence. The steering wheel turned with gentle insistence and I was flying, merging with the blueness of sky, becoming one with the blueness of ocean. Blue becomes black, black becomes white, such bright and brilliant white.